Is this on? Yeah. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who's he he come here for our session on the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability. Thanks so much for joining us online and in person. We greatly appreciate it. Um, so we uh, welcome you all here for the session, DCAN Envisioning for the Future. And uh, I can run through the agenda with you. And the agenda is um, we are going to talk about uh, we are we are going to we're going to talk about the uh, what the agenda is. And first, we will introduce. We have a whole series. We uh, we recently in the past year we. Revitalize DCAD. We created a series of governance documents. We created a code of conduct. Um, we did a series of other things here to revamp the service. And then we also have, for the first time in person, uh, three disability fellows that were funded through the generosity of Vin Cerf, um, who has funded our fellowship program. So we have here Vidya Reddy. Um, she represents India. She uh, has. She'll be speaking. Um, we also have Nico Dimas from Kenya, um, and then we have uh, Professor Inoue um, from Japan, uh, as well as Lydia Best, representing the hard of hearing community in the, the, in Europe. Um, so we'll have a exciting list of speakers here. We also have a mentor here for our disability fellows, Gunella Aspring. So we thank you all for coming. And uh, I will then pass it on to uh, Lydia. And to our, our colleague, Dr. Shabir, who is my co head of the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability. Thank you, Judith. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Good afternoon to everyone present here, and good morning and greeting of the day or evening, wherever you are in your time zones. Thank you very much for joining the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disabilities session featuring uh, re-envisioning the future. Uh, Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability is an advocate of accessibility of Internet Governance Forums. It's uh, visibility of persons with disabilities in the forums as well as the accessibility of the forums for people with disabilities. Uh, with this vision, uh, the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability with the generous support of uh, Windsurf and Google have been able to uh, bring number of persons with disabilities in person uh, to this session. Uh, we actually had a support program for online uh, or remote participation as well, but uh, as so fate happened that the sport applications that we received were mostly related to in-person participation. So uh, nothing about us without us is only possible if person with disabilities themselves, as I often say, come forward and contribute into the discussions. I am really grateful and I thank uh, to our wonderful fellows from India, from Kenya, from Europe, uh, to Vidya, Lydia, Nicodemus, Professor Inoue, and uh, Ms. Tabinta for, uh, for being with us. Uh, this is uh, really uh, a remarkable moment in DICAD's history as uh, we have been uh, struggling for COVID period, number of organizations. Uh, this is a sort of uh, revival of, of the DICAD after going into sort of hibernation for a year or so. 
that's why I really am glad that we are able to uh, bring that forum into, into the uh, living uh, people's uh, life uh, and contribute to, uh, to where it should be contributing, to make the Internet Governance Forums accessible for people with disabilities. Uh, I believe uh, the uh, after the welcome and introduction, the first thing that we had our, on our agenda was to talk about the accessibility of the IGF forum, uh, as has been the, uh, the tradition that we always try to sort of map the accessibility of IGF forums. So I would really want here uh, any of my, uh, my colleagues sitting on this table or in the hall or online, uh, if you want to share your uh, experiences with regards to accessibility of the IGF, if you faced any issues or problems, uh, you have the forum now, you can ask for the forum, the mic will come to you, or online you can raise your hand and Deidre, my uh, co-moderator, will tell us uh, if there are any comments from online. Yeah. Uh, yes, and Judith Hellestein, so we also are happy to announce that uh, the main session of the dynamic, uh, of the, of all the dynamic coalitions will be um, held on, f on f Friday, but we also, um, we also have international sign language on that session. Uh, we found out too late that the main sessions, most of the main sessions, will not have international sign language. That sign language was only available for the high level sessions and for the uh, opening closing ceremonies, but we uh, made it a point that we needed it for the dynamic, co um, for the dynamic session, um, coordination main session, and we were happy that the Secretariat was able to arrange for that as well. So look forward to seeing that as well as Um, Shabir, Dr. Shabir asks if there's any comments on the accessibility of the IGF. Well, I, um, it's Peter Crosby here. I can make a couple of comments if you want. Um, although these are comments I've been making every year, as we all have, I think, in regard to the IGF. And uh, I'm someone with a cognitive disability, so basically I'm looking for information online that's clear, easy to access, and so on. Uh, easy login, all of that, um, and once again, the IGF uh, site, uh, it, it just fails on all those criteria. I do not believe for one second that the IGF site itself, yet alone um, the aspects of it devoted to the forum meet uh, WCAG uh, guidelines. I don't believe there's any proper auditing being done. I don't believe it, it has any input or any meaningful input from people with disabilities. And uh, as with every year, I feel that uh, many people are being excluded because it's much, much too complicated and basically in many, on some levels, uh, doesn't work. I mean, I can go into some of the specifics uh, at some other point if anyone wants, but uh, that's just my experience of it. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Peter. This is uh, really valuable. Uh, I I really appreciate this. The the comment about following the web content accessibility guidelines for the development of of the websites and apps is really necessary. And if this organization, uh, the organization that we are sitting and the conference we are sitting for speaking at, the Internet Governance Forum doesn't follow it. Uh, who else then we can expect that they, they would follow? So this is really uh, a very uh, crucial comment. Thank you so much for, for uh, raising it up. Yes. Uh, Lydia, and do you have something to say? Oh, could you, could someone get a mic to Vidya? Oh, Vid oh maybe Vidya, can you um, stand? Oh, no, oh, Vidya. Oh, Vidya. Vidya, raise your hand. Vidya, raise your hand. 
Yes. Um, so one concern that I had is uh, firstly to do with registration. I think I just needed some help with the registration. Now I exactly don't remember where, but I just needed some help while registering. And also, um, uh, okay, I'm a person with visual impairment and I'm from India. Uh, and uh, one main issue I'm having is with the scheduling of the events, the personal schedule, and also there are, there's the schedule on the IGF website, which has uh, Excel file. So if I open that, sometimes while going through it using my screen reader, I might miss out on some data. And also each time I have to ask uh, my brother who is here, what is the next session? So it's or I have to open my website and getting there with the screen reader is a little bit difficult. So something that I've seen on different conferences which are specifically for persons with disability is to have this schedule in alternative formats like Braille so that at least people who know how to use Braille can get to the session really easily. You know which page number it is and if you put your hand there, you can read it and figure out. So that is quicker way of doing than asking uh, it to everybody and uh, one more session is because I'm now with my brother so I don't have navigational issues because he's able to see but if I would have come here by myself I I'm not very sure how difficult it would be so again I've seen in some conferences where there's a braille map or some tactile uh, the building is made accessible at least through the tactile so when you walk you just figure out the way so or some easily available help where you can ask where to go very easily thank you so much for that um one comment we had i was wondering and maybe vi others can tell us um the IGF also has an interactive schedule now, and whether that schedule is easier to read for persons with disabilities. I will come to that too. Okay, so Shabir says he will come to that. So we're gonna give the floor now to Lydia Best. Um, thank you, so Lydia speaking. Um, I'm looking on the perspective of people who are deaf and hard of hearing. And in general, before we go to any events, we really would like to know how we will be able to follow. So for me, looking at the IGF website, both the official website and the organizer's website, one thing I'm always looking for is accessibility. And there is not an easy way to find an accessibility information and to find out, for example, if all the sessions will be captioned, if all the sessions will have a sign language interpretation, and what about the audio access to those who need it as well. So that kind of information is vital for us to even want to, to travel all the way, because otherwise we don't know what to expect. So I think that's something that can be quite easily you know, resolved and achieved. Just provide us the information of what you have prepared. Thank you. Thanks so much for that. Um, we will make sure that we put these in. Um, just for cl uh, clarity's sake, um, we do need another line item on the bottom, but um, all the sessions are captioned. Um, and in fact, but it's not easy to find, there are transcript links for every session, but it's not very easy to find. So we're going to ask them to make sure that these are more accessible. And there should be a accessibility statement listing the accessibility of each session. And we could add that as a comment to it. Um, Judith, if I can just add, uh, my comment is mostly about the on-site participation. Right. We know that online, in general, we have that information because we can see that there is captioning or sign language for whatever sessions, but we don't know what is happening on-site. Right, but yeah. I think that would be also, should be also in the accessibility statement that's on the website. Yes, I, I totally agree with, with Lydia there that the we do know that the session would be captioned. The high-level session would have the sign language, international signs. 
but all with regards to on-site accessibility, there are a number of questions. And this brings me to my point that I wanted to highlight here. Uh, there are a number of facilities and information. There is a lot of information for on-site participants. One of that is about the, uh, about the different events and programs that are happening. Uh, Vidya talked about, and Judith raised a question about the interactive agenda and program. For me, I consider myself uh, a moderate computer user who is a little bit uh, well-versed in, in the technology, so I can navigate it. But for a user who, who was a basic level user of the accessible technology, this interactive program uh, would be a difficult one to navigate. Secondly, uh, with regards to physical accessibility of the event, we just had before this session, about an hour before this session, we had lunch, uh, thankfully provided by the local host. This lunch has information on the website that what would be served every day and where it would be served. Very nice. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate that. But what, what and where the, the program was lacking was the information about the menus, that what, would, what choices would be there every day, vegetarian, uh, Muslim, or halal food, or et cetera. Uh, the menus were there, they are supposed to be there, uh, but the problem with the screen reader was that it would tell you an image, an image of a picture. Well, that's a no information. If you want to uh, go about uh, making your events accessible, you have to give every information in an accessible format, and that brings us to the point which was highlighted by Peter, that you need to follow the web content accessibility guidelines while developing these websites. This information was put on the website. Had there been a proper audit of the, the website and the pages, I'm sure this information would have come up. Uh, we, we had tried to raise this issue at a number of earlier events as well. Uh, before I move forward, may I ask Deidre, the online moderator, do we have any hand raised or questions uh, in the online space? I haven't seen anything yet. Uh, is there anyone uh, in, the, in the remote space who would want to say or contribute to this discussion that we are having here? I think we are all listening carefully to what okay, is being. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, this brings me uh, to the to the next question, and that I would want to ask my my local friends here. Uh, we have two uh, persons with disabilities from Japan uh, in this room, Professor Inoue and Miss Tabanta. Am I pronouncing the name right? Nearly. Nearly. <laughs> Could you correct me then? Tabata. Tabata, okay. So we have Professor Inawe and we have Ms. Tabata uh, with us in this room. Uh, let's listen to uh, Professor Inawe first, who would be uh, talking to us with the help of the interpreter. So let's listen to him. What are his impression of the, of the Internet Governance Forum? and what he thinks is the accessibility all about. Uh, Our interpreter has a microphone, thank you. Hello, my name is Inoue, Masahiro Inoue. I'm deaf. So I'm using sign language here, and the sign language interpreter is voicing from my signing. First, uh, let me briefly introduce myself. I am a professor at a national university, which is established for deaf and hard of hearing students. And from a deaf perspective, I'm have been engaged in many issues related with information access. Uh, 
and uh, this is the federation called World Federation of the Deaf. And I have been serving as an expert member on technology and accessibility more than 10 years. Among the speakers here, it seems I'm the only deaf person. So speaking from a deaf perspective, I would like to say it is important that deaf people can exchange information, not only in writing, but also in sign language. So um, although it is not perfect yet, the speech-to-text technology has been very much advanced. However, as for the speech to sign language or sign language to speech translation technology, it is far from a usable level. It's uh, still going to take time to reach there. Therefore, in order to ensure equal access to internet communication for deaf people, we continue to need human resources such as sign language interpreters and captionists. So uh, that's what I think for, you know, we need more, continue to use some human resources for that. Now we have a issue, how to bear the cost. That's something we need to consider. Now, the, with the advancement of the technology, you know, if we put our minds to, we can do almost anything. The question is whether we can really realize it. In Japan, various laws have been enacted for people with disabilities, such as non-discrimination law, and domestic standards for accessibility. Uh, well, yeah, well established now. For example, in the case of World Web World Wide Web, in order to the website, in order to ensure the equal access of persons with disabilities, especially for the visual impairment of deaf, hard of hearing people, the necessary consideration accommodations are summarized in guideline. However, these national standards are not mandatory and in Japan. And, and there are no penalty for failure to comply to. That is why we still find many public websites are not accessible for persons with disabilities. That's the reality. Um, one good example is telephone relay service. It started in Japan, but it is based on the law, which uh, clarifies, clearly defines the responsibility of the state. And who's going to be responsible for the cost as well. So. It is very important to have this kind of laws that it's the responsibility of the states to ensure the access of the internet for all people. So in order to realize the equal access for all persons with disabilities, so we have to 
it is important that it is not person with disabilities to adapt and make efforts. It's the state and the society to take responsibility for developing a mechanism to realize full participation of PWDs. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I was kind of nervous. I'm not sure if I could explain well, but that's my thought. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor. This is really enlightening, and the two key messages that I would take from this speech, uh, I, though I won't call it a nervous speech, uh, that was a very uh, well articulated. Uh, one is that we need to do the costing, and when it comes to accessibility, there cannot be any match of, of accessibility when it comes to accessibility. Uh, you cannot compare it. So cost should not be, in my perspective, of course, it is a factor and a, and a main factor as well, and a reality one, real one as well. But uh, to me, it should not be a factor when it comes to making an event accessible for, for people with disabilities. And second and main thing, the one key lesson, if, if the people in this hall and the system that we are contributing to, the IGF system, were to take one lesson from this speech, that would be that it should not be persons with disabilities adapting to the system. It should be the system making it comfortable and accessible itself for people with disabilities. And that is called the social approach, the approach of UNCRPD itself. It's not it's the idea, very well articulated by the professor, but the theme, the theory, was already ingrained in the CRPD, and we'll not be doing something new if we were to, uh, to adopt this approach. Uh, before I move forward with the agenda, are there any comments or questions from the hall or online participants? Uh, Sabia is Judith, oh, so I want to add you. something, and Deirdre, one minute. Um, also, as the professor said, it is up to the states. But one the other thing that I think he also did not mention is that many of these laws were based on, on, uh, on a pre-digital society. And they need to be brought up to date. So the telephone relay is based on an old system when we only had voice. And they need to be brought up to the date the same way just like emergency responses were based on an old system and need to be brought up to date, so they need to have um, video for people who, who could sign in the video and talk into the, EM, talk into the emergency response person. They need to have the ability to have all these type of ways to do it. Um, in the, in the US, there was a law about this, and, the, and they also um, attack, in addition to what he said about the funding for the telephone relay, they also have an additional tax that's put on all the phones to pay to make sure that video is also working. So that when people who cannot, who, who cannot hear can use sign language, and they can speak to that, and it would work well. So all this is important now to make sure that the laws are brought up to the digital, air, the digital arena where video and others are, are needed. Um, and the same thing. Uh, and the issues of also is, as he was saying, pictures. A lot, it, it's an issue mostly of awareness. Society has not, understood they don't that when you have a picture they can't see it so w you have to keep explaining to them saying oh it just says picture if we want people to see it we need to explain what's in the picture just like when you post on Facebook you say this is a picture of X they're describing what's in there they 
we, f we found that when you explain to people, we shouldn't have to be doing that, but when we are doing explanations, people say, oh, thank you so much, we, I hadn't realized this, I hadn't known this. Um, and so we have to, there's a lot of work being done, we have to keep doing on making people aware of what are the issues so that they know and they can address them because many people want to address them, they are just not aware that this is happening because they're so used to just posting and photos and that type of thing that they don't understand that this has to be done. Judith, uh, I, I would, I would uh, well, I have a comment and I would respond to this. We are talking about, so the professor was too polite to not to say that in terms of accessibility, we still were living in dark ages. Uh, on the second point, for individuals, this could be justified that they would not know something about accessibility. But institutions cannot hide behind the fact that they did not know. They are actually there. It is their responsibility to know of accessibility requirements and fulfill them. So for instance, IGF cannot, be, cannot get away with the statement that they did not know. If IGF doesn't know about accessibility standards, so well, uh, it would be, uh, I, would, I would not say anything more about that. Institutions cannot be forgiven, full stop. Uh, any, any online comments, Deidre? Uh, do we? Yes. There are. Yes, please tell us what they are. Um, Mohammed Akram from, I'm, I'm so sorry. I do not remember the acronym for your organization. He wanted to say it is true that voice to text is much advanced, but it is yet not 100% accurate. So we need human resources for human captioning especially in local languages. And thank you, he tells me he's from Pakistan. That's his comment. And he is expert on relay services. Uh, yes, we have him as a speaker. Thank you, Akram, very much for coming online. I will give you the mic in a while. Uh, are there any other comments online, Deidre? Or Not any at person? The moment. Thank or you. Any any person who yes. wanted to take hand, to take well, mic? Um, we did have a comment here that uh, from Muhammad Akram and he wanted it written out into the record. He says, just a comment. It is true that voice to text is much advanced. Yeah, yeah, but just leave it as comment. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, any but other person who, from the online space who may want to take mic and say something? No one has no one. asked uh, Anyone from this hall, any questions or comments that, that the discussion that we just had? Nicodemus? Y yes, Nicodemus, please. Yes, uh, my name is Nicodemus Nyakundi. I'm from Kenya, uh, courtesy of DCAD. And, uh, <coughs> I would love to comment on the professor's input on laws that guide accessibility. Uh, in May this year in Kenya, we did uh, an assessment on government websites, accessibility to persons with disabilities. And uh, one of the realizations that we came to get through the focus group discussions was that, yes, like in Kenya, we have our standards on website accessibilities, but they are not being followed. So we realized that the main key issue is there is no watchdog. There is nobody standing to implement these laws and ensure that the websites are accessible. Uh, another thing is that there is lack of awareness, both in the public and even the web developers. If there is a web developer in here, they will attest that when you are developing a web, there are instances that you will be asked for accessibility features. And the most of them then tend to ignore these features because maybe they are rushing over time or maybe they are not aware that it is a very necessary key component in web accessibility. And then uh, another issue was involvement of persons with disabilities because we realized that they make laws, they make policies, 
but they don't consider the input or the lived experience of person with disabilities. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nicodemus, for this comment. And uh, now I would um, want to move on to our second local speaker, uh, Ms. Tabata from Japan. She has a very extensive experience uh, with the uh, World Blind Union as well. So she might be able to tell us about the accessibility of of websites and digital services in, in other parts of the world as well, as uh, I would also want her to comment if she had a chance to look at the IGF website and how far it was accessible for person with disabilities. Ms. Tabata. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, my name is Michiko Tabata. I am born with a severe partial sightedness, and I worked with the uh, Asia Pacific region of the World Plan Union uh, since 2004 and served to two terms as regional president until uh, the term came to the full stop two years ago. So, sorry, Chair, I might not have the latest issue on the other parts of the world, so let me focus on what we experience here in this country. But before that, I would like to talk a little bit about the, the accessibility of this conference. First, like the, the, the lady from India talked, it was quite hard to register. Uh, the, the registration was not very accessible, and I think I spent about two hours completing. And about one hour, and something that happened which was beyond my control, and everything went gone. So I had to do everything again. It was a very challenging experience. Another thing is the wayfinding of this venue. I came around with uh, a sighted gentleman in the floor, and we had such a hard time finding this room. So the wayfinding needs to be uh, sorted out better, or like having more persons assisting people to find the, uh, the right rooms. And lastly, I was a little surprised to hear at the beginning of the session that only a very limited number of sessions have sign language interpretations. As I will mention, these days the access to web is like the essence of our lives. So the persons with uh, hearing impairments, there might be there should be more people who are interested in all the other issues on the internet. So it's, I know it's, uh, it involves costs, like the Mr. Chair mentioned, so maybe we cannot implement all the interpretation to everything, but there should be more expansion of the accessibility of the conference itself. So that's what I thought from this conference. Um, going back to the, the blindness issues, I'm sure all the ICT experts have been talking about the accessibility features to support access to websites for blind and partially sighted persons, like uh, being able to manipulate in keyboards, having alternative text on the graphics, having names on buttons and links so we will know what will function once uh, pressing that button, and uh, having a flexible flexibility in colors and uh, contrast to support pers uh, the users with who have low vision. So I'm sure y you, there are many people here who know better than me. So I just remind you that these are some of the features that will assist blind people. I recently ran into a uh, statistics done by the Japanese government showing that the high ratio of persons with visual impairment in Japan who use internet 
more than 90%, although it was up to 79 years old, so maybe o over 80 years of age. I'm not sure the race ratio could be lower, but nevertheless, there are so many people with disabilities, uh, even for the, the persons with disabilities in general, the ratio was far above half. So it's very part of the essence of daily lives. For example, um, we the internet access to internet used to be uh, having news on the site, watching movies, watching TVs, listening to music, exchanging communications. But these days, especially in Japan, partly because of the manpower shortage, we are our population is shrinking s gradually. Uh, many face-to-face -face services are going on the web these days, like uh, booking transportation, uh, following the ID in, uh, in identity certification that's been changing by this country over the past few decades. Then about the vaccination for the COVID-19, there are all these things that are so essential to your daily lives that really depend on the access to web. So if you don't have access to websites, for example, you can't book a transportation, you can't get vaccination, you can't have the identity certifi certified properly, all these issues are so serious. So we think that, I think, that the web, access to web should be given more emphasis because of this essentiality in your life, whether you have a disability, whether you are aged, no matter how old or how young, if you want to get public services or private services, you definitely need access to web. Um, another statistics shows that only uh, less than 10% of websites by private sectors are meeting the standards in Japan, Japan industrial standards, which I think is probably a little less strict than the WCIG, but nevertheless, still so little, so few few of the websites created uh, developed by private sectors are meeting the accessibility standards. So the reason is, of course, as some of the participants only mentioned, already mentioned, part may be the cost issue, part may be the awareness issue. If you look around uh, the, the cyberspace, you will see a lot of comments, oh, accessibility, that will reduce designing. Oh, accessibility, nobody will benefit. So I really think we need to strengthen, work harder to raise awareness in the society. And then we also need to draw strategies to persuade to the government that web accessibility is part of your essence, the essence of your life. And it's so crucial for your well-being to ensure the accessibility to websites for everyone. I'm not sure, um, I've, I, I have the clear idea what I can do now, but I will definitely continue to uh, tell people that the access to websites is so essential for everyone. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you uh, very much for this, uh, Ms. Tabata. This is really important, though this, these are life, lifetime real experiences that you just share with us, and I, I really appreciate that. Uh, before I uh, move forward, uh, Deidre, do we have Muhammad Akram online? He was there, yes, he's here. He's here. 
uh, okay, so uh, we uh, we want Mr. Uh, Muhammad Akram to share his experiences with us. Uh, Akram, could you, uh, as a president of uh, Asia Pacific uh, Hard of Hearing uh, Union, uh, tell us that how these services work uh, work for persons with hard of hearing in, in this region, and what would you have wanted to see uh, in, in this conference? Mohammed Akram, you need to open your microphone. Dr. Shabir, could you remind him, please, to open his microphone? Uh, oh, please, Akram, please open your microphone. Oh, yes, we have a, a his. We have a. Uh, maybe uh, IS interpreter, could you remind Akram to open and unmute himself? Or, or, or he's IS, there now. IS interpreter could uh, oh, interpret. Oh, uh, he said. Yes. Uh, okay, our interpreter will interpret for you. Or if you want, you could type it in the screen, and we could we and we could uh, re read it out. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, we cannot hear you if you're speaking. Um, well, we want to maybe while we work on that, we can go to our next speaker. Oh, he's here now. Oh, great. Um, we can see you. But we can't hear you yet. Okay, um, let's, we'll move on to the, uh, to the uh, next speaker, um, Peter, um, maybe Peter Crosby can also talk about his experiences. Uh, Peter, while we work with Akram, do you want to uh, take mic? Yes, I can, I can do that. Okay, go ahead, please. Uh, I'll leave my video off if that's okay because I have a very bad internet where I am. Um, so my just quick introduction, my name is Peter Crosby, I am autistic. Uh, my input today will mainly be around uh, cognitive disabilities, cognitive accessibility. Um, I actually, uh, it's wonderful to hear people's input. Um, but I actually have to confess I find it uh, depressing and even disturbing. Uh, I first came to an IGF conference in 2018 uh, when an autistic organisation uh, asked me to represent them. And it's, it's just really, uh, uh, well, unfortunately, it's not a strong enough word, but here we are, what is it, five years later now, we're still... Uh, talking about exactly the same issues, exactly the same issues. Uh, for the most part, from what I can see uh, in, in my sort of short history of, of exposure to the uh, accessibility sort of movement and what, what groups like, like uh, DICAD are trying to do, I, I just do not see that there is any meaningful uh, progress. I, I do not see out within the IGF or outside the IGF that the issues around accessibility are really being grasped. Uh, I don't see that beyond what I would think of as sort of band-aid solutions or add-ons, uh, most of which uh, are technological, um, that we're actually getting anywhere. I constantly read surveys or interviews with people looking into this area and speaking to people like web developers, and it's really clear that they have no idea what accessibility is except a sort of a box that they have to ch check that comes down from 
uh, whoever's commissioning their their work or their their development or or their designs. I mean, there was a, um, a survey I came across recently, uh, but although it's from a while back, um, an organisation did a survey of thirty seven. Uh, websites that were government services websites in Europe, in different countries, and not a single one of them, not one of those 37, uh, fully complied with WCAG guidelines. And they were also guidelines version 2, not version 2.1, uh, which are more up to date. Uh, from my <laughs> I think that there, there has to be um, a, a sort of a moment of self-reflection here uh, amongst all of us as to what's going on and, and as to how accessibility is being presented because it just seems that the message is just not getting through. I mean, for example, I think uh, in terms of the disability rights movement, one of the big mistakes we've made is to allow people who don't have disabilities to think that uh, disability access or accessibility doesn't concern them. They think it's not an issue for them, but it is an issue for them, or, or it will be an issue for them. Every single person at some point in their lives will, will require accessibility uh, support. I mean, I, 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 even now, I'm a perfect example. I have a broken arm and I cannot access a computer keyboard properly or at all really with my right hand. So I'm using speech to text for most of my text input. And that's a simple example. And I know in terms of, of cognitive disabilities, I mean, one of the uh, as elements, key elements of, of what cognitive accessibility is about is for example, being uh, overwhelmed by too much information. Now, every single person in this room at some point will have come across a website where they're being overwhelmed by too much information. But that's happening because that website is not following WCAG guidelines, whether or not you have a cognitive disability or not. Uh, you know, people who, uh, I mean, recently also, because of my arm, uh, I was hospitalized. I was on medication. I had, a, I had real trouble. Um, being able to to access the, the web or the internet in the way I normally do. And there was a few days there I could not do it at all. And once again, that's because uh, these measures are not being in, put in place, but it also it's an example of how all of us are impacted by a lack of uh, accessibility measures being put on place around all, the whole field of ICT. It's not just the internet. Um, so that's uh, very briefly, uh, I mean, I won't take too much time. Um, my feelings in regards to this, um, if anyone wants to know anything more, perhaps about specifically about cognitive accessibility or disability, um, maybe I'll put a couple of links in the, in the chat for people to follow up in their own time, and, uh, unless anyone has any uh, specific questions. but. I, I think in going forward, in, in, to sort of summarize or conclude for, for DICAD, for me, uh, it, it has to be about education. We, we've got to somehow find a way of reaching people and educating them about what accessibility is, that it's not some big bogeyman, that it's uh, simply an essential part of ICT, or essential part of web design, it's not something that you add on as an afterthought. It has to be there from day one. And it also has to be monitored continuously. Uh, I mean, that survey I mentioned before, one of the points they made is sites are put up, they comply with WCAG guidelines, they get ticked off on, and then no one monitors them. And you come back two or three years later, and all of a sudden, you have a site that's, that where you have a lot of content that's inaccessible. So. Anyway, they're, they're my thoughts, and I'll, I'll pass back over to uh, you. Yes, thank you very much, Peter, for these inful, sites, uh, inful thoughts. Uh, these are really important. Uh, the key message that we take from your speech is that the accessibility has to be there right from the start, 
and there has to be the processes that keep the accessibility sustained. Uh, the question that you ask, I think we all should ask, uh, and we all need an answer to it as well, that the message, if the message is not getting across, what do we do? Uh, we have a message from uh, Muhammad Akram from Pakistan. I would ask Judith to read that message for, for us. Judith. Yes, thank you. This is uh, um, reading Muhammad Akram's because he prefers to type in the chat. This is Akram, president of Asia Pacific Hard of Hearing Foundation. I will just focus on online meetings and training program accessibility. More than often, Organizations depend on auto captioning that is not accurate, special for people from different accent and languages. It causes a lot of barriers and they need human captioning until captioning becomes 100% accurate. Another point is awareness. Even if captioning is available, speaker and trainer need to know that there are people with hearing disabilities so when they refer to any image or diagram, give some pause so we can see the diagram. We cannot read captioning and look at a diagram at the same time, as hearing people can listen and watch diagram at the same time. So this awareness should be part of online meeting and training management. Besides, one important point is that captioning, both human and auto, is available for far fewer languages. We need this in local languages too. We are always working to promote human captioning for local languages, but it's a big challenge. Thank you. Yes, um, Akram, yes, thank that you. Is thank you very much, Akram, for, for this uh, very insightful message. I understand that there's a there is a short time, so uh, I would move quickly with the agenda now. I would ask Lydia Best uh, to share her thoughts with us because this is right right after listening to uh, to the president of Asia Pacific Heart of Hearing. We now listen to Lydia Best, who has been uh, with the DICAD for for so long. She knows IGF and she also knows the accessibility services. So, uh, Lydia. Um, thank you very much, Muhammad. And um, I am today, I'm wearing quite a few hats in January, so it's difficult. But today I would like to say that I am um, as part of a joint coordinating activity on accessibility and human factors from the International Telecommunication Union as the co-vice chair. But also in Europe, I wear a hat of the uh, president of the European Federation of Hard of Hearing People. And I work very closely with Akram. So I would like to say, after what we have heard today, I'd like to agree with every word we've heard. And one of the things is we're talking about awareness and we're talking about the laws which don't really mean anything often, especially when these laws are not following with fines or the implementation is not being checked, etc. And Akram touched on another thing, tick box exercise. Because sometimes in these laws, we don't really do anything when it comes to the quality, the usability of the access being provided. So for example, broadcasters can decide, let's do auto captioning for the broadcast news. And nobody cares if it is 100% accessible or not, but we have put something there, so it's there. So I think when it comes to the laws, uh, when it comes to the accessibility in general, there has to be that quality also being followed. So it's quantity and quality, not just quantity itself alone. And at the ITU, we have developed together as persons with disabilities, experts with disabilities, as part of a um, global initiative on accessible ICTs, G3 ICT delegation, two technical standards um, which are able to guide and to ensure those who are developing and working on the meetings, for example, like a remote meeting today, as well as in general accessible meetings to understand what is needed, what needs to be before the meetings, during the meetings, and after the meetings to make sure that they are 
fully accessible. And those standards provide good framework. And it's not difficult to follow. It's a matter of one tick to load and on, on this as well. What is also those standards include human factors. Because you can have sometimes a person, you know, maybe doing something and say, OK, I will do the caption, uh, auto captioning because we don't have the money. Fair enough. But then someone needs to actually monitor what this auto captioning is producing. And then if that information is not correct, bring correction to it. Often it doesn't happen. And we are often left completely bewildered about what has been said. And we cannot participate fully if we don't understand fully the discussion. There is one more thing. The pandemic has definitely been responsible for pushing accessibility forward in some innovation, isn't it? But again, it's often not quality checked. So um, for our, uh, from our perspective, it's in, in making sure as well that when we discuss accessibility, innovation, we need to understand that both have a place. Sometimes we use auto captioning in personal meetings, which is enough because between ourselves, between the groups, we understand how it works, so we know when to intervene and to fill in those gaps. But when it comes to languages and human captioning, sign language is the same way. We need the human resource as well to be developed. And what we're seeing, and what is a danger, that many companies, many organizations, including governments, think that it's enough that we invest a lot of money in the innovation alone. There is no need to invest human-related services to train the, the, the um, human resources to support us. And that is the danger here. Thank you. The floor to you. Thank you very much, Lydia. Uh, we do have a couple of other speakers as well, and one of them is uh, Vivian from .nz. Uh, and I really am grateful to Vivian, who is the CEO of the .nz, that on my invitation she decided to uh, be a part of this session. Uh, in New Zealand, uh, .nz has uh, initiated some accessibility-related projects, and I'm sure from today's discussion, you uh, would have a lot of food for thought when you go back and uh, do some improvements on those projects. Uh, Vivian, do you want to share something uh, about uh, about your projects with us uh, with, with very brief time, three minutes, say? Thank you, yes, just a couple of comments. Um, thank you for the invitation and um, great to be listening to the uh, reminders about the importance of quality access. So, um, .nz is a relatively small organisation, uh, uh, but one of the things we're committed to do, doing is returning funds from people buying a domain name uh, back to the community. So um, I've just been in this job for a year and I was concerned that those funds returning to the community included people with disabilities in terms of who was getting the funds. So I just really wanted to share some simple things we'd done from, from you know, the New Zealand Domain Name Organisation to include uh, fund distribution to communities of people who have got particular access uh, requirements. Some of them are so obvious it's almost embarrassing, but they have had a big impact on who applies for funding. So the first is on our website, in terms of criteria for funding, we have clearly identified that people with disabilities are a priority. There are other population groups who are also a priority, but we've clearly specified this group because of the potential for being excluded from in participation. Uh, the second thing that we did was basically say, you can apply any way that works for you. 
if that's phoning up and having a conversation, we'll we'll fill in the forms from there. Or if uh, you want to have a meeting and uh, you know, it's like you tell us what works for you and we'll adapt. So that's been a really important part of making our fund application process accessible. Um, and then finally, we've left it up to groups who approach us to determine how they measure the outcomes of their project. So um, over the last uh, year, we have had nine projects funded <coughs> from the disability community and they range from people funding their own um, content, telling their stories within their communities, to innovation around smart access, to research on the best ways for teaching people with disabilities how to be safe online, um, to human generated transcripts for deaf blind people. Um, and I, I'm so excited by the caliber of applications that we've received and the diversity of work. I, I would just kind of finish by noting that I don't think Internet New Zealand is anywhere close to being great at um, access or including all people. And, um, and, you know, it's a commitment we've made and we'll continue to be on that journey, but uh, I feel very proud what we've achieved in, in this um, first year of our, of our focus as a priority. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Vivian, for, for this very brief intervention, but this is very useful. I, I really appreciate you coming to this session. Uh, the, one of the underlying thing that I would want to uh, share with one of my, with, the, with, this, with this session and through this with the other uh, registries and registrars in the domain name industry, uh, that you have a lot of potential to make a lot of good contribution in terms of accessibility, provided you do the right thing. Uh, one of those things could be following of the of on the steps of dot nz. Uh, knowing that you have deficiencies is essential for improvement, and I believe that dot nz knows that. So uh, this is really great. Uh, we also have uh, Yosunobu Ishii uh, from Relay Service Japan. I would also want your input. Uh, on to this service and, and what are your thoughts about the accessibility? Yasunobu, please. Yes, thank you very much. <coughs> uh, I'm Yasunobu Ishii uh, from uh, the Nippon Foundation Telecommunication Relay Service. And I'd like to talk about a uh, little bit about our work now and also the suggestion. Let's skip some slides. And uh, I think uh, all, of, all of you already know about uh, telecom, uh, te telephone relay service already, so I, I skip uh, the explanation of this part also. And now, uh, when we, uh, together with uh, Professor Inoue, we surveyed and found more than 25 countries have uh, legislative framework to support uh, official telecommunication relay service. It was 20, uh, 2017, so I think it, the number is growing now. But uh, my point is uh, more than, uh, <coughs> not more than, most of countries, almost all countries uh, support only for conventional telephone communication and not supporting the communication using internet-based web like uh, Zoom or Teams, Meet, uh, WhatsApp, Line, etc. So we are, even though we are official organization, uh, 
uh, designated by the Minister of uh, Communication in Japan, we are not able to support uh, the communication uh, through uh, such internet-based apps. So I would like to suggest to uh, establish a framework, a legal framework, and funding mechanisms to sustain a continuous support of human support, such as uh, sign language interpretation or other kind of uh, help for the people who need to make their communication. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Yasunobu. Uh, Didre, do we have Grace online? No, uh, just I for the- I haven't noticed her, but Andrea Sachs, a former coordinator of DCAD, had said a little earlier that there were some comments that she would like to make. Oh, Andrea, are you still online? If you are, please uh, unmute yourself and go ahead. She may have trouble unmuting. She told me she couldn't find the, micro, the oh, microphone. Can, can someone from the technical team send her a request? She dropped off? Yeah. Deidre, uh, well, I'm moving on with the agenda, but please uh, let us know if she comes back online. Uh, we will pass the proceeding, and of course, she is one of the respected members of the DICAD. She would be given a chance. Whenever she is online, please feel free to interrupt us and let us know that Andrea is online, and we'll give her the floor. Uh, moving Thank on you. with the agenda, uh, so we do have activity report. We listen to what Relay Service does and what the .nz is doing with regards to accessibility. So this is perhaps the right time uh, to move forward with the, with the activity report of Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability, DICAD. Uh, but before I give the floor to Judith, my co-coordinator for the activity report, I would request the audience to think about the future activities that DICAD can undertake. Because right after next, the question for you is going to be that what should be the future activities of the DICAD? So Judith, over to you. Thanks so much. Um, so this year was basically a rebuilding year. Um, and we uh, worked under a small team organized by Lydia Best to um, create some new governance documents for the DICAD. So we looked um, at several different, uh, we looked at several different other DCs that have been very successful and we uh, figured out after a long discussion what would be our new governance documents. So then we published those, those could be found on the website. We also um, wanted to make sure we had a code of conduct because sometimes what happens is that there's uh, several, sometimes there's disruptive people or people who are not respectful of others. Um, we wanted to make sure that DICAD is a place that is respecting everyone's contribution. So we worked to create a code of conduct, um, which has always been a touchy subject for dynamic coalitions because we want to have and we welcome and open to everyone. But And so therefore, we, we ha as a UN, coal, a as a dynamic coalition of the IGF, which is part of the UN, we want to make sure that we don't not include people. So we work to, uh, with the coalition, with the uh, main coordinating group to create a code of conduct based on that. So we've done that. And several other, uh, other activities, we are looking at how we can move forward in the future, whether should we be um, working with committees? Do we want, if someone suggests a, 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 an activity for us, we would then work to create a committee possibly to look into that activity, whether it's being a program activity or a research activity. Um, and another one of our activities is our new, is the reinvigoration of the fellowship program. 
uh, Shabir mentioned earlier, and we are so glad to have gotten this fellowship off the ground. This was our first year. We learned so much from doing our fellowship for this year um, so that we can apply it for next year and make it even better um, and, work to, and work to really help some of the people to really, the idea behind the fellowship is to have people with disabilities be able to really attend the conference, whether they need to have an assistant, an aid with them, or whether they're not. Um, we want to make sure that it's well inclusive and they really can get the most out of the conference. And so that is what <coughs> guided us on our, on our goals here. Um, and as we want to hear from you, uh, we're doing a short, we'll put this up on the web, but as we're down to our last 10 minutes, we want to make sure that we leave time here for also from you to hear about what are your future activities, what do you want DICAD to do in the future. Um, but also I want to mention is that all these suggestions that you have about how to improve the IGF, we will put in in our, f in our guide to future ones. Um, and that we will work also with new other people, the secretary, um, we work closely with Celine Ball, who's the new um, IG, part of the uh, new permanent staff to the IGF Secretariat. And she's been really helpful and instrumental in getting, helping us in getting requirements. And it was her help that actually brought in to have the IS interpreter for the main session because um, she wants to make it, but she's new to this field, and so she doesn't really know. So I think this is really helpful that we have someone who's committed to doing it and working with us. So we want to hear from people what, are, what other future activities you want to do, um, what kind of programs you want DCAN to have. So please do let us know, and we could pass the mic around. Um, so uh, please, if there's anyone uh, in the room who wants to raise their hand, please lo do let us know. Um, or if there's anyone online, Deirdre, you could let us know if anyone. Oh, Masahito? Yes, Masahito, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, my name is Masahito Kamori. I'm the Rapporteur of Accessibility at ITU International Telecommunication Union. And also, I've been working with um, disability organizations as well as persons with disabilities organizations for many years so far. I think I've been working with Lydia as well and, uh, and all of the DICAT uh, management people. Anyway, so I, I would like to suggest that uh, there are several things that we find important for this group to work on. One of the things is that um, I think with, uh, especially WCAD uh, standard should be implemented and also tested or certified or something like that. So um, I think um, probably DICAD can work together with ITU to promote that kind of um, guideline or some kind of recommendation on how to do it. That's one thing and especially on the, the use of um, uh, the page, what we call a page reader or text reader uh, for the visually impaired people. That's absolutely necessary, as uh, Ms. Tabata said. It's, uh, it's not something that nice to have, but it's almost, uh, it's already something must have, so we have to do it. Another thing is a very important point that has been raised by Mr. Ishii about how to integrate the telecommunication uh, networks uh, with the, the web and internet. And especially, I think that's one of the things that uh, has been proposed in the United States by the United States government, how to accommodate for example, identifiers with uh, telephone numbers. And that's, I mean, especially for telephone numbers, that's where ITU comes in. So that will be a very good uh, collaboration point, um, how to work on integrating 
accessibilities in the telephone network as well as the web and the internet uh, platforms. I would suggest that these two or three things to be on the agenda of the, the future uh, work program of DICAD so that, uh, and also a collaboration with ITU. Thank you, that's my yes, point. Thank you, uh, yes, thank you Masahito. Thanks, that's, uh, that's a really uh, good suggestion. I would address these to, uh, to my closing remarks. Any other Dr. suggestions? Shapir? Dr. Shapir? Yes. Um, Mohammed Akram had something, had another comment to make. May I read it? Oh, please go ahead, Deidre. One thing that needs work is helping countries in making mandatory web and apps accessibility policies with quality and same time need to empower organization of persons with disability in this topic so that they can push and monitor implementation of such policies. And I would like to add my plus one to that comment. Thank you. Yes, this is uh, really a great suggestion. Any other comments from here in the hall or online? Ganela, come Ganela. to. Oh, please go ahead, Ganela. Thank you very much, Dr. Shavir. It's Gonala Esprink uh, from the Internet Society Accessibility Standing Group. Uh, and uh, I'm delighted to be here. I have been involved with DICAD for a number of years, and I'm absolutely delighted to be taking the role of mentoring um, the travel uh, support fellows. Uh, it's, it's really wonderful to be interacting uh, with you, uh, Vidya and uh, Nicodemus and uh, and Lydia, um, we've just met for the first time face to face after knowing each other online for a long time. So, um, in regard to uh, my role, uh, I'm, I'm in in the standing group. We are working hard on on training in disability leadership in internet governance and digital rights. And we have developed a syllabus um, for uh, a training course to be developed online. And there's also been a face-to-face -face workshop for South Asian participants. And I can see there could be a great link between DCAD and the Accessibility Standing Group when it comes to training and mentoring in disability leadership. So I look forward to further discussions about that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ganela. These are uh, the comments that I would want to respond to in my closing remarks. Uh, before I come back to the hall, Deidre, do we have Andrea Sachs online or any other comments? I don't think Andrea's come back. I keep going to look for her and okay. she doesn't seem to be there. No other comments. No other comments. Okay, so any other comments from the hall before I go to my closing remarks? Yes, please introduce yourself and have your say. My name is Misako Nobura and uh, <coughs> I'm from Japan, and uh, I'm working for a person with a disability for many years, and I participated in WSIS 2005. After that, I stopped, but uh, I, I came back here, and uh, I, I heard that the, you, uh, someone said that the uh, activities improve IGF in terms of accessibility, right? And then uh, maybe the same thing happened at that time. That they are still <laughs> what we need to do. So uh, do you have any strategies to uh, improve IGF? So yeah, thank yeah. you so much for your comments. Yes, we do. <laughs> we are working with the team. One of the problems we've encountered with the, uh, like we had or Peter mentioned with the <coughs> website and the others, is that the UN hires 
a contractor to do it, and they tell the contractor, we want X, Y, and Z on the standards, the contractor tells them, yes, we have it, but they, they don't test it, and yeah. they, they, and so but there's just like people talk about an enforcement ability. There's no one enforcing it, and so maybe what we could do is insist on it, uh, on have you hired a testing firm? Yeah. Who is the testing firm? Because when we had this issue, they said they have this, and what we are going to do with the future is work closely with the IGF Support Association, who's been helping to funding the human captioning and others, and that they should not fund, if they're gonna fund for website improvements, they need to have uh, a results-based program saying, okay, where's the evidence that you've done this? Um, and then, uh, okay, so let me then, that's, so that's one of the things that we'll do, but we could follow up afterwards. I wanna give the last two minutes to my colleague, Shabir, Dr. Shabir, to close out the session. Okay, sorry, but yes, I, I'm really expecting what do you are doing from now on? Yes, okay, thank thanks. you very much. I will address to it. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for, for being with us, Deidre and Judith, for, uh, for your moderation. And of course, the captioning services, the sign language interpreters. Uh, thank you very much. And most of all, my panelists and speakers, who, uh, whosoever took the mic, I cannot take uh, and name you individually, but you know who you are. Who you are. Uh, thank you very much for uh, coming here, participating in this discussion. A couple of points that are really important, and that's why I avoided to take uh, individual names. Uh, one, uh, we do need to coordinate with other organizations, and I really appreciate uh, Ganela Aspring from Accessibility SIG of the Internet Society. Accessibility Standing Group of the Internet Society with the proposal that we could collaborate. Of course, we do want to collaborate how and under what conditions we can discuss. Uh, same is the case with, uh, with the relay service and the, the suggestion that Masahito gave and, and Akram gave with regards to uh, the collaboration on, uh, on, on forcing or motivating governments to enact policies and to sort of uh, give the organizations of person with disabilities empowerment to uh, to uh, and, and build their capacity to work on accessibility related issues uh, on the same wavelength I would also want to uh, extend this offer to uh, to dot NZ and other uh, related uh, registries and registrars uh, not just in the region, but uh, in other regions as well, that if you want to uh, come and collaborate with the DCAD, uh, we would definitely welcome your, your inputs, and we would also uh, would be gladly offer our, our uh, expertise and sports wherever we can. So just let us know what you uh, actually require. Uh, lastly, uh, I think the, the strategy is very important. And I do hear when Peter and, and our lady friend from Japan say that th we are discussing the same issues. Uh, and it's, there is no progress. That's one way of looking at it. But I see uh, at the things a little bit positively. Uh, my lens is a little bit different. I do share the skepticism that you, you people have. But on the other hand, uh, 10 years back or even seven years back when I attended my first IGF back in 2017, we did not have the real-time text captioning for all the sessions. Uh, only there were certain sessions for this real-time captioning was provided. Uh, same is the case with the sign language interpretation. Same is the case with the physical accessibility of the buildings and IGF sessions. Uh, today, we see a lot of improvement on that, that side. So uh, if I say that I am not totally disappointed with the system, I do share the disappointments, but I totally am not disappointed with the system. That's why I keep working uh, with, the, with the system to improve it. I keep 
uh, uh, raising my voice wherever I can uh, to improve the system. And that's uh, where we all come in, the dynamic coalition on accessibility and disability come in. Uh, the main purpose of the DCAD is to, uh, to ensure that IGF system is accessible. We also want to work with uh, our uh, NRIs, uh, national and regional initiatives on internet governance. Uh, but we, we, on that, want to, uh, the, the NRIs to come to us to, to work wherever they need our assistance, our support. Uh, we uh, worked with APRIGF this year to make it accessible, but that's partly because of most of our uh, persons, uh, our, our, our team was in the Asia Pacific region, that's why we could work with them. So uh, while having strategy is important, having this ambition is important that we want to work with NRIs, we would also want the, the people with disabilities in different regions to come forward themselves. Because if we demand nothing about us without us, that should, that is ipso facto implemented on us as well. That if we demand it, we have to come forward and work, work with these initiatives. Uh, without us, of course, nothing should happen. But at the same time, we should also come forward to work with these initiatives. Uh, because if we get disappointed uh, and leave the discussions by saying that nothing is happening, no one, uh, nothing is getting improved, the and we left the halls from the and we left the discussions, uh, the implement uh, the the ultimate decision. Then we are leaving uh, with the with the people who are not experts according to our own words and languages. So. For one, I don't want to leave anything, any decision about my uh, accessibility of the internet in anyone's hand uh, who is not expert on accessibility. That's why I keep working, and that's why I expect from, from the members of the Dynamic Coalition that they would keep supporting me. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming.